Hi there, my name is uh, Nicholas Cairns. Um, I am a herpetologist from Canada. I live in Valmarie, Saskatchewan, which is in the southwestern corner of Saskatchewan, uh, next to the largest Canadian population of horned lizards. Canada at one point had two species of horned lizards. Uh, there was the, le the uh, lesser short horned lizard uh, in southern Br British Columbia, um, which has since been extirpated, and the greater short horned lizard uh, in southern Alberta and southern Saskatchewan, um, which are currently persisting. Um, there are some some. Uh, interesting populations, really sp uh, spotty populations uh, in southern Alberta. Um, some are, are still quite strong, others not so much. Um, but the largest population occurs here in Saskatchewan, um, in, mostly in Grasslands National Park. Our greater shorthorn lizards in Canada do primarily eat ants. Larry Powell found that they ate about 70% ants. However, the larger individuals certainly take larger prey. So Hernandez eye is not nearly as specific as some of the other southern species, and it's not uncommon. However, they do eat mostly ants still. Um, you see them eat a lot of Formica ants around here, especially with the larger females. And especially this time of year after they've given birth, you'll often see them eating fairly large prey, uh, like large grasshoppers, crickets, spiders. They'll, they'll eat pretty much anything that comes anywhere close to them. And they, they're capable of taking fairly large prey. They, they do have a pretty robust uh, jaw set for them for, for a horn lizard. Yeah, so around here you'll see them, uh, many, many ants, but it's not uncommon to see them take a large grasshopper either. Also around here, uh, they, they have a number of predators. In the park, uh, in Grasslands National Park, we've found individuals that have lived through attacks by northern grasshopper mice. We've also fairly routinely now uh, seen them put on fences and on buffalo brush by shrikes. Interestingly, un unlike many other species uh, eaten by shrikes, uh, they don't seem to get the cervical separation that uh, that other horn lizards and other li uh, other small vertebrates uh, receive from a shrike, and I don't know exactly why that this is. Perhaps the uh, the vertebrae in the cervical region on on uh, greater short horn lizards are, are really robust and hard to to get their beaks into, um, but they often just uh, impale them and wait for them to die. And then uh, another interesting observation that, that we made just recently is that. Greater shorthorn lizards in this area, especially the uh, the gravid females, seem to be being eaten by ravens. And although not an invasive species, uh, ravens haven't been seen in the southern Canadian prairies all that much in until recent years. There's a lot of history to suggest that they were fairly common when bison were common. With the the destruction of the bison and the loss of that major food source, ravens sort of moved north. And now due to human litter and a number of other uh, aspects that might subsidize ravens, all of a sudden we're starting to see ravens again quite commonly in, in the southern prairies. And we found a number of females that have been eaten by ravens, or at least their livers have been eaten by ravens. And we talked uh, to some experts like Wade Sherbrooke, who suggested that this was probably a corvid, given the, the uh, damage to the, to the carcass. These lizards are being at the northern extent of their range, persist through some rather extreme conditions. Our overwinter temperatures often uh, go below minus 40 degrees Celsius, and our summertime temperatures can exceed 40 degrees Celsius. And so these lizards live in one of the most extreme conditions you could possibly imagine for an animal uh, so close to the ground. As most people know, the uh, greater shorthorn lizard in most of its range is an upland species. So for example, you can find the same species in Texas and Arizona, but they're in 
the mountains. Uh, but here, this is a uh, prairie species. This is a species that occurs in sort of the open slopes, river valleys, and areas with, with quite a diverse uh, assemblage of forbs and grasses, um, but with lots and lots of open space. And specifically in grasslands, they're almost exclusively located in areas of bear paw shale. And this shale seems to be important for them in order to find overwintering habitat um, because of the extreme winter temperatures that this species experiences, uh, they obviously have to go underground. However, um, when they go underground, according to Larry Powell's research, they don't appear to go underground that far and they've been found as shallow as seven centimeters from the surface uh, in a, this sort of loose, frailable shale um, that they, they seem to make their living on. But where they choose to overwinter seems to be critically important. And they are almost always found in areas with fairly deep snow cover. Considering we have very little snow in this area, they are often found in coolies uh, or overwinter in coolies and, and depressions that fill with snow. So they have that extra insulation coming from the snowfall. And this actually presents one of the greatest threats to this species that we haven't really well defined. That being the fact that the amount of snow and the amount of freeze thaw seems to be varying in recent years. So more research is actually needed to define this, but we know from some of the work done on snakes in the area that heavy snowfalls followed by really quick thaws can uh, not only for, uh, cause some flooding and slumping, but they also then leave the animals exposed because there's no more snow insulating them from changes. So late freezes, early freezes can uh, be major risks to these animals. You don't think of reptiles as requiring snowfall. If you look at this habitat, I mean, there's no other way for them to make their living in this habitat than to have some protection from the extreme temperatures. I mean, in a, in a lot of these coolies, especially if you look on the southwestern sides of some of these buttes, the snow sublimates. It's it. There's such extreme sun even in the winter that we don't have a liquid stage of the water. It just goes from snow to vapor, and the air temperature still might be well below zero Celsius, well below freezing and it's just sublimating. I mean, with the exception of some, some very extreme things like red-sided garter snakes and, and some of the amphibians that live in, uh, further north, uh, it's very hard to imagine an animal that lives in more difficult conditions, especially because most of the other herptofauna that live here spend most of their time underground. So like tiger salamanders spend most of their time underground. Whereas um, we've seen horn lizards out when the air temperature is 42, and we've seen them when the air temperature is, is six. And the ground temperatures in those cases were lower and higher than those values. And these animals are still thriving. The fact that they overwinter in burrows as shallow as seven centimeters. So they very close to the surface, well, well within the, the ground freeze line. So most other, most other lizards and snakes in Canada have to get well below the frost line. To survive and yet for some reason these lizards seem to be able to survive above the frost line so whether they're freeze tolerant or not we don't know because we just don't have the populations to conduct such an invasive test horn lizards in canada being um well just one species now are and even when there were two species uh, they're both live bearing species of phrynosoma um, so the greater shorthorn lizard gives birth to live clutches uh, in Saskatchewan, usually late July to early August. Uh, and these clutches can range from six individuals to 12, 14 individuals, most seemingly around eight. Uh, Larry Powell has, has quite a bit of, uh, done a, quite a bit of investigation in, into reproduction in these guys. But the most impressive aspect of this feat is the mass change in the female. So, our females only have a few months between mating and at just post-emergence. So in the really early spring, they mate. So April through to early May, they, they mate. 
the females then double their weight. So if, if we had a, a large female in our area would be 16 to 20 grams and they'll go up uh, to 40 grams or 30, 35 grams in, in just a couple of months and then give birth and lose all that weight again, go down below their original weight and then eat enough food to be ready to hibernate in September. Their clutch size and their reproduction is really interesting, but the most fascinating aspect for me is how these animals can go through such extreme changes in body weight, the ability to produce and use that much fat in such a short period of time is just remarkable. There are very few animals that double their mass that quickly and then lose it again. They're just the most remarkable creatures in terms of their reproductive biology. Um, so the horned lizards in Saskatchewan, um, like Hernandez eye across its range, uh, are sexually dimorphic with the female being the larger species. When not gravid, the females sort of um, max out in weight at about 20 grams, uh, and a large female would be in the like in the low 70s in terms of millimeters long snout to vent without the tail. So a, a modest sized horn lizard. Uh, the males are about a third of the length, but only weigh about half as much, and they're quite a bit narrower than the females. Uh, and this probably um, speaks to some of their natural history with the females being relatively sedentary, uh, moving from their overwintering site to a relatively small patch of, of habitat. Uh, and then the male, um, the males being narrower and, and more mobile, uh, they probably serve uh, a really interesting uh, genetic exchange between patches of habitat. Um, you very seldom see the males in the same spot twice. Uh, whereas I watched one female for four years and she spent the summer in an area that was two meters wide by two meters wide. And she was there every year for four years until she died. So yeah, th there's some really different and uh, interesting behavior between the males and females with the males being these, these highly mobile or relatively mobile by horn lizard standards, uh, little genetic packets and the females being these real home bodies. Being Canadian, I didn't have much exposure to lizards. I, I was lucky enough that uh, my grandparents had some alligator lizards on their property in, in BC, which I always found um, really amazing to watch. Um, but I, I didn't grow up in horn lizard habitat. I grew up on Vancouver Island, um, which is on the west coast of Canada. When I was 17, I was lucky enough to go to the Southwestern Research Station and uh, I got to, uh, to shadow Wade Sherbrook. Uh, I don't know if he knew I was his shadow, but I, I, I tried to glean as much as I could because I'd always been very interested in reptiles and amphibians and specifically lizards. But, you know, living in Canada, there's not much diversity to, to, to play with. At least that's what I thought. And so Wade was kind enough to let me tag along as often as, uh, as, as he was able to let me tag along. Uh, and so we went road cruising for Texas horn lizards and, and round tails and, uh, and looking at, at uh, Gambelia, uh, the leopard lizards and, and all these other cool species in, in southeastern Arizona that I, I'd never, uh, you know, I'd, I'd seen pictures of, but I wasn't sure I would ever see. Um, and once I had that experience, I was completely hooked. There was no way I was, there was no way I was not looking into this more in depth and spending more of my life working at, with uh, lizards. And so I ended up in Manitoba working uh, with Pamela Rutherford on prairie skinks. Um, and uh, then I, by happenstance uh, and quirk of, of, of life, uh, I ended up in uh, southwestern Saskatchewan and uh, uh, married, uh, married into uh, Parks Canada uh, my wife works for Parks Canada, and so we live in Valmarie and um, next to the best population of horned lizards in Canada. And so ever since, I've been trying to do as much as I can with them. Um, although, you know, for me, a lot of it is just walking around uh, in the habitat with my kids and showing them at this point. So, yeah, it's just uh, this, it all started with a couple of road trips with, with uh, the horned lizard man. And uh, it's led to a, a lifelong fascination.
He used to just drop me off in the desert when <laughs> at, 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 when he took his kids to school, and now my kids are almost the same age. But yeah, he uh, it, it, I, he was so kind and 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 just so patient with just an annoying seventeen year old kid that wanted to look at lizards. So in the future, I'm hoping to look a little bit more at some of the specifics of predation pressure in our local area using um, plasticine models. I'd also really like to explore the roles of snow cover on survival uh, and temperature modulation and, and hopefully population fluctuations. Uh, and beyond that, I want to look at some of the communication between individuals, as a lot of lizards have very flashy um, belly patterns, uh, and phrynosomid lizards tend to have much more plain belly patterns. I want to look at some of the roles of belly exposure and throat exposure, and maybe some cryptic signaling within these groups, as well as um, between male and females, um, especially because the females are so much larger than the males, which uh, may play more of a role in the males trying to woo the females as opposed to more coercive mating strategies. The hope is that if we get enough information, we can uh, show whether these animals are in fact threatened to give us a better idea of the conservation risks and the priorities we should put uh, in mitigation for these for this species in Canada, um, which may be useful as well in the northern U.S.